Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for uh, another series on our Bible study platform, Ask the Pastor. We are going to start today a very important topic, the doctrine of Trinity. And I hope and pray that um, at the end of this um, study, at least we will have a bit more understanding on what Trinity is all about. Let me tell you in the first place itself, none of us can ever understand God fully, but what is revealed is in our hands to grasp and understand to an extent that we can make sense of who this God is. Um, three, uh, right, right now I have put it into three parts. I don't know as we go through if a necessity comes, I will add more. Um, today we will look at is the doctrine of Trinity in the scriptures? Uh, what are the objections to the doctrine of Trinity? We will do next week and then we will look at the evidence for the doctrine of Trinity and how we can understand it. Okay, today we will look at the doctrine of Trinity. Is it in the scriptures? Um, I want us to know in the first place itself, we are trying to define the what? Undefinable. We must understand human limitations when we try to understand God. Imagine trying to define something that you cannot define. It Even to think of that makes me wonder what am I trying to say? What am I trying to understand? So let's understand human limitations in this matter. But having said that, Christians have struggled for centuries to express within the limitation of human language the unique revelation God makes of his mode of existence. It has been a struggle for so long. Uh, look at this, what Isaiah 40, 25 says. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One. Can you imagine what that means? This verse is loaded with meaning that humans can never comprehend. To who do you come? When we try to describe something, we always associate it with something that's tangible, something that is within our framework, something that we can compare to. But God is trying to say here, Isaiah chapter 40 is an amazing chapter. You should read it. It describes the greatness and uniqueness of God. He's saying here, to whom will you compare me? Tell me, think of something anywhere in human life or in the universe that you can compare God to. If you ask, to who do you compare Deborah? I have a thousand ways to say it, isn't it? We always can compare with, you know, she has a sister, Donya, her mother I know, her brother I know, and how she looks I know, where she lives I know. We always have this time and space framework within which we can describe certain things. But what about God? It says, to whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal? That is an amazing statement that he makes. He is totally unlike anything else. God cannot be compared to anything in the created order. I want us to get this very clear. God cannot be compared to anything in the created order because he is beyond creation. He is beyond comprehension. That's what makes him unique. That's what makes him God. So, and if in the first place itself, I want you to get this. When we say God is like, when we say, sometimes we say God is like this or God is this, we are treading on a dangerous ground. We may illustrate a certain aspect of God's being, but we fail to give a complete picture. Oh, God is loving. God is kind. God is generous. God is merciful. God is forgiving. To a certain extent, we can give some explanation on what he is, what he does. But to define what he is like, not knowing, not seeing beyond human language, we need to know our limitations. Human language fails to describe God in two ways. One is our language is based on time, isn't it? Whatever we speak, it is limited to time. It is limited to space. Beyond that, our language doesn't make sense because you can't comprehend something beyond time. 
we speak of when we speak of time what we say we speak of the past we speak of the present we speak of the future but god is not limited to time as we are if you want to describe anything you always think in the framework of what you can see or heard or believed or perceived but that has a framework of time and space thus when we speak of him with our language we are forced to place misleading limitations upon his being isn't it i'm trying to understand something that is beyond human comprehension beyond imagination beyond time beyond space but trying to make sense of it in the limitness of who i am and the time that i am in and the space that i occupy i'm trying to describe something that's beyond me beyond my time beyond the space that i am occupied with so you can see the uh, limitations that it brings for human mind at the same time i'm trying to describe somebody who is beyond human imagination in the first place also so our language is not adequate trying to put god into human language why language is important that's the only way you can understand and express something but try putting something that doesn't belong to human language into human language that itself is a limitation isn't it trying to put sing put something into human language that is beyond human language itself shows the limitation of human beings i hope you're trying to understand what i'm trying to say about who god and the second the way that we fail to describe god in human language is excess baggage that comes with the language we speak for example our words often carry with them a baggage like what that has become attached to the meaning of a word the the way we use a word may use to conjure up a particular mental image every time we hear for example if we say in our language a person we already have made a picture of what that person could be or would be or will be we attach it to all sorts of baggage that comes with our own personal experience we think of a physical body when you say a person what are you thinking about oh there's a physical body he or she is an individual they are not me they are separate from me we think they occupy some space donia lives in colchester she is fair she has curly hair her height is this her weight is this she is of this age you know when we think of a person these are the pictures that form in our mind based on our limitation of the word person in the language of human expression for example when we say god when we say god the father what kind of picture you get all the pictures that are drawn about god the father with a long white beard an elderly man an old grandfather like thing isn't it that's what is the... so trying to put god in human framework in human time and space and human language is itself a limitation that's the point i'm trying to get to understand because i'm trying to describe something that's beyond time beyond space beyond human when we think of a person we are always limited to a body to a mind to a physical attributes somebody that's different from me maybe looks like me has hands and legs and no whatever we could think of when the word person is always associated with the mental picture we already have how a person is we may not have seen him or her but we know what the person means so when we associate that with god as a person we already have a mental framework of that personhood of god in human language with the limitation of a human example that itself is a limitation that we are struggling to understand someone who has never been seen never been described never been comprehended so please understand how humans are limited in certain things that's why i said we are trying to define the undefinable okay the mystery of godliness there are so many mysteries on this uni in this universe that man cannot explain man cannot comprehend one of the great mysteries that will remain as a mystery is the mystery of godliness in in, the, in itself despite all human understanding description and agreement 
concerning how to portray God as a unity of three divine persons worshipped as fully God, we still have not come close to defining or understanding or knowing God. Everything that we have accomplished is still simply knowing about God. No matter how much knowledge we have, how much we try to describe who God is, what Trinity is, we are still incomplete. I must be humble enough, you must be humble enough to say, God is a mystery. I cannot understand understand everything. That's what makes him God. That's what makes me human. Well, if you say in psychology, philosophy, or in reasoning mode of language, it is a way of escape because you are not able to describe your saying like this. That which you cannot describe cannot exist also, they say. But this is what the world is made up of. The history of contemplation concerning the mystery of Trinity is one of the constantly learning more about God without ever knowing about God. And all too often, it is a history of having to backtrack. So it's a constant education. We cannot come to a conclusion at any point of time in any scholarly language. This is it. God is this. If that is the case, then it cannot be a mystery. Having said that, God has given us glimpses of who he is and how far we can go to understand who he is. Uh, like the earlier scholars like Augustine, he makes this statement. He says, happy failure. What does it mean? In trying to know God and to understand the Trinity can in many ways be our happy failure as well. There's no harm in trying to understand God who God is, what is Trinity, what is Son, what's the Father, what's the Holy Spirit. We are not saying don't study because their mysteries leave them. No. God has given us reasoning power. He will help us to an extent where we can make sense of who he is. And if we fail to understand him fully, Augustine says it's a happy failure because we at least tried to get to know this loving God that we worship. Having a correct view of God and being able to understand his salvation, his forgiveness and his love better does not take away the mystery of the Trinity, the mystery of who God is. This is an amazing statement. Just because we understand some certain aspects of God, that his salvation, he died for me, he forgives me no matter how much sinner I am, his love is not comparing to anything. All these are characters that make us understand God who he is. But no matter how much you understand God, the mystery still remains of who God is in complete comprehension. As a human, if I could stick with that understanding, I can know God to an extent where I can make sense of him, but I will not know him completely. It shows your spirit of humility and dependence upon this God who is a mystery in many ways. And that, that activates your faith to look up to him in much more greater passion than try to know every little bit aspect of God. So that's why it's a mystery. Mystery in the, look at what actually the scripture says about the mystery of godliness. Paul, Paul himself, who have seen the vision of God, who has seen God strike him on the road to Damascus, having visions about God, having uh, used by God in a miraculous way, hearing the voice of God in many ways, he himself says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. He says, difficult to understand the mystery of godliness. In one of the famous chapters in he, Corinthians, he says, I now see through partly. I see through dim. I can't see clearly. God, he says, what is this mystery of godliness? God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among Gentiles, believed in this world, and received up in glory. He summarizes this mystery in these five phrases, talking about what this mystery is. And still it's a mystery because he can't understand how can a God be manifest in flesh and all these things. Second Thessalonians 2.7 says, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Not only godliness is a mystery, God is a mystery. Paul also says sin also is a mystery. We think we understand sin fully. No. 
maybe the aspects of sin we may understand to a certain extent. But it is a mystery that will be revealed later. He also says, Romans 11, 25 to 27, lest you be wise in your own sight. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of Gentiles have come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved, that is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. This is another mystery that Paul talks about how God sometimes hardens his heart in saving people that he loves. Certain things he can't make sense. So I, I, the point I'm trying to make is in the beginning itself, I don't have answers to all the questions on Trinity. But God has not left us in darkness, not to know who God is, why God is described as Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to a certain extent, to the level where humans can understand this great loving God, God has revealed. So in this study, we will only look at what has been revealed, how far we can go, and beyond that, I have no answers, and I don't think anybody on this planet Earth can really give an answer to something that's mysterious, someone that is beyond human language. So what is Trinity? Here we refer to the doctrine of Trinity. It has been said that one may well lose his mind trying to understand it. This is important statement. You try to break your head, very difficult to make sense of it, no matter how much you try. But at the same time, you will lose your soul for rejecting it just because you can't make sense of it. You reject it, it could even cost you more because I know people who doesn't make sense of what they hear. They feel, well, this is nonsense. If they can't tell me, explain to me, what's the point of believing? That's a human way of looking at things. There is something called divine element in our understanding that's beyond human intelligence that which we have to hold on by faith. That's where God says in to Timothy, to Thomas in the last days, he says, Thomas, you believed me because you have seen me. But blessed are those who believe me who have not seen me. That's you and me talking about. The element of faith is key to understanding the mystery of God to a certain extent. So you try to understand it. Someone said you lose your mind because you cannot make sense of it completely. And you ignore it, it could even cost your soul because you're rejecting the existence of God himself. So the Trinity refers to the idea that God is one but can be experienced in three different persons. The word Trinity comes from the word tri, meaning three, unity, meaning one. By the way, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. It does not appear in the Bible. This has been coined by the scholars in the early centuries to understand the Godhead, which the Bible speaks about. What does Trinity mean then? The three persons of a Christian Godhead, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or the state of being three. Is the word Trinity singular or plural? plural? What do you think? Is the word Trinity singular or plural? It is a singular word because the plurality of Trinity is Trinities. Okay, there are three main categories of Trinity in Christianity. When we talk of Trinity or the Godhead or the person of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three thoughts of school run. There are many others, but I just put three main things, what we call consubstantial Trinity. What does this mean? This version of Trinity is characterized as a single divine being. He is comprised of three persons sharing one indivisible, undivided substance. Most people who believe this are Catholics, Orthodox, Trinity, and even many theologians of the Adventist Church who have heavily influenced by evangelical authors also fall under this category. That means it's only one being, three persons. And they are trying to make sense that being and person is distinguished. Being is different from a person. We will try to understand these words a bit later. I'm just giving you the definitions. The second category is called modalistic trinity. 
this version of Trinity is comprised of three modes or roles occupied by single divine individual where one God is manifested or revealing himself in three different ways without distinct and coexisting persons in the divine nature. For example, Father is Son, Father is the Holy Spirit, and so on and so. So it's the same person operating in three different modes. That's why it is called modalistic trinity. That means God is only one. He operates as a father. He only operates as the son. He operates as the Holy Spirit, but it is just one person. That's what is this modalistic trinity. That's this, because he operates in three different modes. It is called modalistic trinity. There is the tritheistic trinity. This is the Trinity is comprised of three distinct divine persons, but they understand persons as individual beings who all have same power, same nature, purpose, etc. But they are in agreement in everything they do. They are said to be one God, not that all three make up a single being. The majority of the Seventh Adventist Trinitarians would fall under this category, which means tritheistic God means God is one, but three different persons, three different individual beings. We'll try to make sense of it later, but I just gave you the categories. Now, this is the diagram that many people try to make sense of. How is Trinity understood in Christian circles? One, the Father is ex exactly one God. Sorry, there is exactly one God. The Father is God. See, look at this. The Father is God. The Father is, the Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. So God is the middle. He is the Son. He is the Father. He is the Holy Spirit, just like the uh, modalistic. There are others who could say, Father is not the Son. Son is not the Father. The Holy Spirit is not the Son. But they are God. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not. The Father is not the Holy Spirit. I think... I'm confusing you more than what you're confused, but this is how two ways of how people see it. How is Trinity understood in Christian circles? Based on that diagram you saw, let me make a sense of how at least some major churches or major Christian thoughts believe in this. For example, Methodists, they, their statement of belief is, we believe that God is understood in three distinct forms. God is one but three forms, they call it. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are commonly used to refer to the threefold nature of God. That means God has three natures, three forms. Sometimes we use other terms such as the creator, redeemer, and sustainer. This is one way the Methodists understand. And the Lutherans reject the idea that the Father, the Son, and the are merely are merely faces of the same person, stating that both the Old Testament and New Testament show them to be two distinct persons. So in other words, Lutherans believe father and son are not the same. They are not the same person. Lutherans, so they accept the father and son to be having a personhood, but when it comes to Holy Spirit, this is their understanding. Believe that the Holy Spirit proceeds from both the father and the son. That means Holy Spirit is not and doesn't have an individual identity. He is not a person. He is a spirit that proceeds from the Father and from the Son. Pentecostalism, God is the Father. God is the Holy Spirit. They refer to the Father as the Spirit and the Son as the flesh. So oneness, Pentecostal rejects the Trinity doctrine, viewing it as a pagan and unscriptural and hold to Jesus name doctrine with respect to baptism. Jehovah Witnesses reject the Trinity doctrine, which they consider unscriptural. They view God as the Father, an invisible spirit, person separate from the Son, Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit described as God's active force rather than the third part of the Trinity. And I don't think they believe much on in Jesus Christ also in many ways. Church of England, there are three persons within the Godhead, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. These three persons have equal status and are equally divine. As Look at what our Adventist doctrinal statement is. There is one God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. 
a unity of three co-eternal co persons. God is immortal, invisible, all-powerful, all-knowing, and ever-present. He is infinite and beyond human comprehension, yet known through his self-revelation. God, who is love, is forever worthy of worship, adoration, and service by the whole creation. So Adventist statement, God is one, but there are three different persons, what they call, what we call co-eternal persons that is existing. So you, you can see within Christian circles, people have different opinion what the Trinity is all about. Is it one God or one person in three or three different as one God? That confusion or that kind of an understanding is different from almost every Christian denomination or circles. Uh, let's see what the Bible has to say. First of all, we all we say we don't say we have three gods, we say one God. Where did we get this from? Deuteronomy 6, for this is the foundation text for uh, belief in one God. God was telling, Oh Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. There is only one God. 1 Corinthians 8, for therefore concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no other God but one. Paul talking of one God. Galatians 3.20, now a mediator does not mediate for only, but for one only, but God is one. 1 Timothy 2.5, for there is one God and one meteor between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So every time you think of God in the Bible, nowhere you will see plurality of God in terms of how we see it. God is one. It doesn't say gods. We use the word God. But having said that, Bible also has evidence for plurality of God right in the beginning of creation. It says, and God said, let us make man in our image. You, you, you see the language, let us make man in my image, no, in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish and the birds and all those things. So us and our, talking about the plurality. God is not talking to angels here. Angels are not in the image of God. So God is talking to Godhead. Let us make man in our image and let him have dominion. You can see the plurality of God here. Also, Genesis 3 to uh, sorry, uh, yeah, Genesis 3 20. And the Lord said, Behold, the man had this is regarding the Tower of Babel. Behold, the man has become what? like one of us, knowing good and evil. Again, talking to the Godhead. Who is talking? I don't know. But the conversation is in the Godhead. Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life indeed. And live for, for, sorry, this is in the Garden of Eden. And then 11, this is, this is the Tower of Babel experience. When the wickedness of the world has gone so much, this is what God said to Godhead. Let us go down and there confuse their languages so that they may not understand one another's speech. The plurality of Godhead is seen here. Isaiah says, you see the vision of Isaiah when he was, look at what in the God. And I heard the voice of the God saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? So God wanting to send somebody on behalf of the Godhead. That's why he says, I want to send on our behalf. And then the answer from Isaiah was, here am I, send me. You see the plural, plural, plurality here. Isaiah 48, 16, draw near to me, hear this. From the beginning, I have not spoken in secret. From the time it came to be, I have been there. And now the Lord has sent me and his spirit talking about the prophecy of Jesus. Jesus' words, God has sent me and also he sent his spirit. 
the plurality of the God. Now, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. These are the words of Jesus. Sorry, I forgot to put the text here. Um, so he's saying, talking about God and his and the spirit are with him. Plurality of God, Matthew, this is the experience of the baptism when Jesus was baptized. Jesus was physically there. God was speaking in the voice and the spirit came in the form of a dove. And the voice of God was heard saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. At least here you can see the three distinct persons of the Godhead. Son in the water, Holy Spirit in the form of a dove around him and the voice from heaven, this voice of God saying, that is my son. Matthew 28, 19, the gospel commission is also in the plurality of God, not plurality of gods. Get that difference, the plurality of God. Now, therefore, may go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Distinct personhood of God is what we are asked to give baptism or bring people to the foot of the saving grace of Christ. The Paul talking about the, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. When pronouncing a benediction, pronouncing a blessing, he uses the personhood of God in the name of Jesus, God and the Holy Spirit. Three distinct persons. Psalmist says, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Who is the Lord talking to another Lord? Father talking to the Son in this incident. Psalms 2, 7, I will tell you, tell of the degrees. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Again, the personhood of God, the Father and the Son expressed in this verse. Numbers 27, 18. So the Lord said to Moses, take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit and lay your hand on him. Again, God and the spirit here in action. John 14, I will ask the father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit. You can see the Godhead here, the father. Jesus talking about his father, that he will ask him to send a helper in the, in, and that helper is called the spirit of truth, he says. So each member of the Trinity is God. Look at John 6, 26. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. God Jesus here talking about God, his father as God. Now, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Now, this is the Godness of who? The son. God ascribes his father as God, Jesus in the first John 6, 27. When it comes to John, John the beloved is talking about Jesus himself, who is God, who, became, who was with God, who is God, and who became flesh. Now, Peter said, Ananias, why have Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. So here, Peter referring to the Holy Spirit as God. So every member of the Trinity is God. Jesus in John 6 says, Father is God. John the Beloved through inspiration says, Jesus is God. He became flesh. And through the inspiration, Peter talking about the Holy Spirit, he says to Ananias, you have not lied to me, you have lied to the Holy Spirit because lying to the Holy Spirit is lying to God. That's what he means. So which means the Holy Spirit is God. 
So there is no inferiority or superiority in this Godhead. All three person of God is God. 1 Corinthians 3.16, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? So our bodies are temple of God, God's spirit. That means God himself dwells in us. So subordination within the... So while we see that E3 are God, as we have seen, there, is, there seems to be a sub subordination within the Godhead, not in terms of who they are, but in terms of their functionality. I think I will add one more session on this, the relational the relational aspect of Trinity that would make sense in a more way. I was actually, I have a book uh, uh, here, if you see Systematic Theology, God is Trinity. I was going through this book this week and I found some good information. Uh, hopefully, I will try to put that in. It really makes more sense to see God in a relational form to understand Trinity rather than just on a theoretical level. I will add that one also to make it more sense. But in this case, you see, while God is equal, God is co-eternal, there is no hierarchy, there is no inferior or superior. But when it comes to functionality of this Godhead, you will see some kind of a subordination within the Trinity concerning the Son, John 5, 36. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John, for the works of the Father has given me to accomplish the works that I am doing bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. You see here, you see the subordination. Father seems to be superior to the, father, to the Son, not in terms of personhood, power, or equality, but in terms of functionality. He says, Father is the one who sent him. And when he was praying, he says, Father, if it is possible, remove this cup. Why can't God, Jesus himself is God. Why can't he remove that one? But he is asking his father, if possible, to remove the cup. You see the subordination in terms of their functionality or relation-wise. Concerning the Holy Spirit says, I will ask the father and he will give you another helper. Why can't Jesus say, I will send? But he's saying, I will ask the father. And he will send you another helper to be with you forever. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. You can see the subordination of the functionality in relation to each other in working of the salvation of God. You can see some kind of a subordination coordinated in how they work together for the saving of human life. John 16, 13, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare it to you, the things that are to come. You see again the subordination of the Holy Spirit to the Father and to the Son. That's the role they picked up or took upon to coordinate well the salvation of man in this form of subordination within the Godhead. The work of Trinity in creation. Right in the beginning of the creation, you can see the aspect. In the beginning, who created the world? It says God created the heavens and the earth. We, are, we sometimes say Jesus is the creator, not the God. He gave the power for Jesus to create. But the very first beginning verse says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. You can see the Trinity in action, even in the creation order. Talking about who created this world, look at what through the inspiration, the author of Hebrews says. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things. And look, through whom also he made the universe. Now try to compare these two verses. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now Paul, Paul uh, the author of Hebrews, whom we think is Paul, seems to suggest God created the universe through whom? Through his son, Jesus. 
if the, of the New Testament. So you can see the, the, the Godhead in the creation of this uh, thing. Another text. In the, the, uh, sorry, it is John 1, 1 to 5. I forgot to put John here. It is John, the Gospel of John 1, verses 1 to 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and look, it says, through him all things were made. Who made? God made it. Through whom? Through God the Son. Without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of our mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome. So when we think of creation, God created. When we think of God, we simply ascribe to the Father. But in the creation story, and then when we think of who actually created within Godhead, we tend to think it's Jesus. But the creation is by God in Godhead, or Godhead itself. You see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in action in bringing this universe or bringing life and creation to this world. The work of creation. What about salvation? We know Jesus died for us. This is how the salvation is viewed in Christian history. The Father was the one who originated. Salvation actually originated with the Father. Look at what it says. How the Father chooses before the foundation of the world and predetermined our adoption as his children through Jesus Christ. The Father is the administrator of salvation and he oversees the process from beginning to end. Look at John 3.16. It says, it doesn't say Jesus loved the world so much. It says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So salvation originated with God. We're talking about Godhead in relation to human salvation. That's why, because he loved the world, he wants to save the world, he sent his son through whom salvation was possible, is possible to all human race. What about son? Salvation is brought to fruition. While God originated it, God, Jesus, the son, is the one who brought it to the fruition of this salvation. Everything the father does for our salvation, he does through his son, Christ. That's why he says he loved the world so much that he sent his son. The work of the son means redemption, adoption to the father, reconciliation, sanctification, glorification. It operates horizontally as well as vertically. And it is for Jew and for Gentiles. It is through the son that we achieve salvation and come into full relationship with the triune God. What about the Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit is the one that communicates to us the message of salvation. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, to convict you, to teach you, to guide you, to lead you to this person who is responsible for our salvation. The Spirit changes from the inside out, performing the gracious act of regeneration. With this comes the gift of faith and the spiritual ability to believe in the resurrection. Through the Holy Spirit, our salvation becomes a present reality, applicable to our lives in our own specific context. It is the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives that seal, serves us as a seal, establishing us as children of God. So you see in the work of salvation, in the creation also, the triune God working together for the salvation of human life in a different aspect of what they would do. Now, as I said, the word Trinity is not found in the Bible. The word is coined by our early fathers and they were trying to make up uh, from the doctrines of the Bible. But the Bible uses what we call the word Godhead. Godhead at least is mentioned three times in the scriptures. Acts 17, 29, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's advice. This so Godhead, you see, talking about the triune God. Romans 1.20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. A revelation of God through nature. 
God is revealed, he says. And then, and God, for in him dwell with all the fullness God had bodily. I forgot to put the text here. Please find the text. Maybe I will correct this later. There is a text here for him dwell with the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So just a glimpse of how the Bible describes one God, triune God, Godhead, the evidence for one God, the evidence for Godhead or Trinity. But that is just, I this, this session we just looked at what the Bible says. But there is the other side of the story, what we call the objections to this Trinity of God. Why it is it it it, it is not it is why it is not possible to have three gods, or why is it pos not possible to defend the doctrine of Trinity? We will study next week. I think when we compare what the Scripture says and what also the Scripture says in terms of objections to this Trinity. Then we can come to conclusion, what not conclusion, then we can at least make some sense of what can be and how far can we go to understand this Godhead or the doctrine of Trinity.